Welcome back to the Court Right Cast. This is part two of our The Shining Doctor Sleep uh, discussion, where, as you can see, we're still wearing the same clothes from the last episode, so we're filming it all in one shot, but we're releasing it in two parts because I think it's really important to focus in on each film individually a bit rather than talk about them both broadly. And I'm really interested to talk about Doctor Sleep today because, Jonathan, you have an opinion that I would really like explained. Okay. You told me that you think Dr. Sleep is one of the only, or one of the few, if not the only, good 80s movie remake slash spinoff sequel films. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Now defend yourself. Um, okay. <laughs> no, just tell me why you think that. Because I'm going mm -hmm. to go ahead and say this for the audience. I think Dr. Sleep was awful. Okay. Uh, I think it's a rock solid movie. Um, I think it has really good Ewan McGregor performance. Um, I think it's, it's incredibly different from The Shining. It's an 80s sequel that doesn't rely on repeating all the same plot points and uh, major scenes from prior film. Um, I think that it functions well as a supernatural thriller. I, I don't think it's quite a horror movie. It's I don't think it's scary enough to be a horror movie. Um, I thought it had a good villain performance from, what's her name? Rebecca Ferguson? Yep. Um, I thought it had a good child performance from the child in the movie. Yeah. Abra. Um, Kadabra. Can we, can we talk about that at least? Like, no one backs up that name, right? <laughs> <laughs> the first scene you see her in in a movie they're literally talking about abracadabra and then it's just, her name's abra but they don't actually explain why no. it has nothing to do with that scene we just say it um <laughs> i think it has one scene which I, I i thought was incredible um where the villain tries to go into her mind um and the way that that's visually represented was just really unique and interesting to me um i thought that by the time it went for all the Shining references, which it holds out on for a full two hours, it had earned its ability to do that um, by proving itself as a movie prior to that. And then by the time it hit the Shining references, I was all in for it. And um, I really liked the ending. So, uh, you gave me no grounds to argue back, um, but that's the broad view. Okay, so... I'm excited about this because I disagree with just about every single thing you just said. Okay. And I'm as someone who you saw it longer, like I said, I, I'm fresh off these movies. So these are like immediate reactions. Mm -hmm. You know, I watched the um, Dr. Sleep this morning in one sitting. Um, I thought Ewan McGregor's performance was solid. I didn't think it was much to write home about. I liked his scenes where he, like his more emotional scenes and bits. Um... I thought that Rebecca Ferguson, as someone who would watch anything that she's in, I thought that her performance was incredibly lackluster, as well as what is up with her accent. She's doing an American accent in the film, and it hurts. It might be one of the worst American accents I've seen. You can literally just hear her native accent. It just comes out, like, all the time in the movie. It Like, she twists words in her mouth in ways that it sh they just shouldn't twist. <laughs> like... How does someone, a director or cinematographer, or whoever is supervising the filming of this movie, not like make her do a thousand takes? Or just, it would have been better if she just kept her accent. Is there a reason that we didn't just go with her with British accent? Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I, was, I was confused about that. Within the first scene of the film, I was sitting there laughing at how hard it was to even pay attention to what she was saying because the accent was so off. She literally says words in the British accent. Like, blatantly, while also, like, going right back into the uh, American accent. It was it was hard for me. and I But I say that as someone who really loves Rebecca Ferguson as an actress, and I want to see her succeed. I felt like her performance was very much just a cardboard caricature of what, like, a gypsy woman would, would be like. Um, the plot of the movie made... I thought it disrespected The Shining to a severe degree. Um, because I think that the... Following the plot thread of uh, Danny and The Shining, you know, the, his shine ability and the struggles, I, I, I was still on board early on in the movie when he was dealing with the trauma of his childhood. Even the, the beginning scenes, 
um, the kind of callback scenes. I, I enjoyed a lot of that. Um, the him getting sober, talking about his dad, stuff like that. I, I, I was on board for that. It was when the movie uh, devolved into a really bloated like cult with like all the world building in the movie is really thin and vague intentionally so so that they can do whatever they want with the plot in a way that also if you jump around i don't want to jump around from beginning to middle to end you know in an um incoherent way but uh as these thoughts are coming to me it's like i have so much to say the shining is such a film that you frequently are wondering what's real and what's not correct like there's a lot of like is it a dream is it not is it on their head you know what is real about the actual haunting elements, you know, like do these things exist? Can they affect them in reality? Cause they do to an extent, you know, in the shining, um, Jack Nicholson gets let out. <laughs> He's like locked yeah. up in the, like the fridge or, um, pantry or whatever. And he gets let out and they never explain that. Um, so not to go down that rabbit hole, but this film acts like everything is real. There's never really much of a, like, is it real or is it not? And I do think that you can give them a little bit of leeway with that, but it made me question. Um, second, the actual world building surrounding turning every turning it into a plot where pretty much it's like, oh, there's these people with abilities, but it's not like The Shining is just this one thing where you can see the past or the future or see something else going on and you, or you can talk telepathically how they present it in the original Shining film. In this film, they just kind of go with, some people are kind of superheroes. They just have like crazy abilities. Like you can just make people do what you want with words, you know? And then we get 15 minutes of plot with uh, the new recruit from the cult that is useless, nothing to her character, nothing going on. It was just to show you them initiating someone to try and tr just to try and show the audience how they take the steam, which is another thing I want to get to the actual world building surrounding the steam and the, the, that life force and all that stuff was so lazy that it kind of hurt when they're like, talk. the world's not steamy anymore. Like, hey, name it something better. Like, am I at least right about that? Like, Wait, what kind of world building is we need to get the steam? <laughs> and then I also thought that um, it, I think that when you go too much down the visual effects route and th the movie had a real problem trying to over explain things for me in that, the showing like CGI breath, like constantly <gasps> being sucked up by a bunch of people that like look like zombies and then their eyes glowing was way too much for me. It was, it, it really broke the grounded feeling of a psychological thriller. What do you mean it's too thin and it's too over explained? Oh, the, the world building is thin and that there's nothing, there isn't substance behind it. There aren't rules. They play without rules. The world building plays without these rules where they don't specify whose powers are what or what they can do or what they might be able to do. It's like one minute the shining is like we can kind of talk to each other. But then it's like we can talk to each other across hundreds of miles. Then it's someone can start meditating and then climb into someone's mind and like have a confrontation then it was. It was also in the well, beginning. I mean, of that the film, kind of falls in line with telepath with telepathic then, abilities, the, which is then in the beginning the main of the film. Spoons are attached to the ceiling. Right. This then there's one person who can control people. Then they yeah. don't really specify the those other are, people. Those are kind of all in line with the like Professor X telepathic ability, which is like pretty basic like powers. I don't think to have. I don't think it's tele. Both going into somebody's mind, communicating with them lifting spoons I can understand all the fall going in line into, with the same I can understand that but also keep in mind we never touch on those abilities again like the lifting spoons happen once but we pretty much never address well, she can't like just physical spoons. manipulation it's a, it's a, it also that was when she was like a toddler my point being we never address crazy. physical manipulation again and then same thing for the um, the girl the initiate recruit that's uh, used in the film of being able to just tell people what to do and they do it right you're, you're naming see, things that all fall in line with the same line of powers. I can see to, that be, falling in line with that, but they don't set rules. They just kind of say some people can go in different directions. They also, they have the, the baseball boy and they're like, he's super special because he can hit home runs because he can kind of see maybe where the ball's going to come. It's I'm saying it's all yeah, incredibly they vague. They kind of me. all fall in line with the same it's thing. It's all incredibly vague and they allow their the characters to do whatever they want with based on the needs of the plot. If that makes sense. 
like even in the end when we're like we start going into mines and stuff and then you know we, then we start using the hotel you know later on to affect reality in a way that i don't think i thought it broke some of the illusion of the original one and some of the eerie creepiness of the shining itself you know because there's so much of like is it a dream is it real is it not and then we go in and then all the lights start coming on in the hotel mainly because we just need the shots lit and we need to explain that you know like everything felt like they were laying the path well, no, I mean, as it as look, they were walking it uh no i mean it's what's well, based it, they didn't make this up it is based on the doctor sleep stephen king novel that was another, it's very faithful to it that was another question that i had was i almost i thought to myself that it was probably a lot more th- faithful to the doctor sleep yeah uh, it's it's novel. it's fairly faithful to the doctor sleep book um the whole ending is not though the the, the whole the shining ending they don't go back to the overlook hotel because okay. overlook hotel in the original book burned it's gone yeah um that that is the only part that is like majorly rewritten mm-hmm. for the movie the rest of it the cult everything like that does <laughs> it is lifted from the that's book how, um that's how you can see my dislike of stephen king in his world building because stephen king i have a lot yeah, of respect I, in for a movie like doctor sleep i couldn't care less about world building i couldn't care less about the cult and i couldn't care less about what the shining is specifically i the think shining the cult is itself a, was a bad addition to the film from the start um i mean i i don't agree but that's fine um i think that as a continuation of danny's story i was incredibly pleased and happy with the with how they went with it following the line of abuse and and, and addiction um as a bridge between the shining um the movie shining and book shining i thought they did a good job of it it is a stephen that's the thing is that while it technically is a sequel it's a stephen king adaptation and the end of it is a sequel Mm -hmm. um and the way that the way that they had to do that is that stephen king famously hated the shining movie and hated what they did with it so you know Actually, the end of the movie is technically um, more like the ending of the original Shining book yeah, 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 than it is. So in that, I feel like he was successful in bridging um, the two fan bases. I feel like it was a successful Stephen King adaptation. I felt like, as a film, it was effective at what it was trying to do, which was to be a supernatural thriller. Um, and... I felt like as a continuation of Danny's storyline, it was effective and fell in line with what um, his character would have done from The Shining. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I felt like bridging those two fan base gaps, it was successful. And I feel like there was some really strong visual storytelling, specifically with the scene where uh, she goes into her mind as an interesting way to represent that. Because you see these really crappy blockbusters where there was clearly no thought put into how anything was done uh, or trying to do something in a unique way. And I felt like that scene was really interesting and unique and showed that there was like actual craft behind a pretty pulpy story. And, and then as a fan of the shining, by the time we get to the third act, I was on board with it. By the time we get to the shining references, I was like, okay, they earned the ability to recreate every single shot from the original movie. Um, so that was like a nice icing on the cake for me. But, interesting yeah so i yeah, just couldn't it's... disagree more and couldn't <laughs> couldn't not I, have the problems less than what you have i also um stephen king i respect as a writer but what he does incredibly well is uh conflict and character uh character voice specifically um what i think he does really poorly is uh world building and plot especially endings um so i thought that the cult itself was just poorly written from the start i thought all the characters Everything was incredibly cartoonish, which I can get behind to an extent, but everything ended up feeling incredibly thin. So I found myself more just laughing when this like these gypsy people are like, the world isn't steamy enough. They literally say steamy. <laughs> like It's awkward. The I thought the visual representations of like keeping canisters of smoke and like ingesting it like drug addicts was just it was too much. I thought all the scenes where they were doing things like that were like too car i don't want to say too cartoonish because that is a visual style in itself and i think it's okay to go but for me it didn't land the the entirety of the cult stuff did not land and while rebecca ferguson's performance as the villain was believable and she did not do anything wrong i did not think that it was like gripping if that if that makes sense i think that diverting the focus of the film over to abra the child 
also undercut Danny's arc because I liked Danny's arc. Danny's arc from point A to um, the end is a good arc, like you said. Like I like what they did with this character. However, I felt like they took the focus off of him to tr- almost make it like the girl was a main character. Or I think the problem was that the girl became a driving force in the plot. She was the one driving the force. Whereas, it, so it ended up feeling like Danny was a passenger to the plot frequently, and th- that could be all part of the book, and they were just doing it according like, to Stephen King's I wishes. I like how their characters. But then again, that that goes back to I don't think Stephen King has a great. Uh, I, I don't. I do not like the places that he takes his stories for. Well, you're you're saying what he does well and what he doesn't do well. Well, basically, the only thing that I care about in a movie, in terms of engaging me or whatever, is character and conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like what we talked about with Justice League is that if the characters in conflict are engaging me, then I'm not going to notice the dumb stuff that's going mm-hmm. on or the ridiculous stuff that's going on. There's a there's a level of forgiveness that comes when you like the characters enough and you like the conflict enough. And I was invested both in Abra's um, character and story and Danny's character and story to where all I needed the cult to be was was uh, kind of creepy and a threat. And I thought the scene where they killed the uh, the baseball player uh, kid that was, was a like scene. actually really a well done because I, 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 like I didn't the expect effects. them to I didn't expect them to yeah to do that as long as they did but I thought it was good for establishing the threat yeah and worked well so for me I think all the, visual the cult needed really to be the believability for me like the, the glowing eyes um, and the smoke type of stuff was too much it didn't bother me but um I felt like only the the cult only needed or really needed to be um threatening and kind of creepy and I thought they did that fine Abra and um, Danny's story was what needed to be strong, and I thought it was strong, and it carried me up to the two-hour point where then sort of The Shining takes over and carries you the rest of the way. I, th- I think it's a little too long, too, though. Well, I, I, think, I, I, I also think I watched the I watched the th- over three-hour director's I cut, wanted to see I liked that it one. even more. I was interested to see that one. Because there's, 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 like, e- there's, there's a good amount. More. I have a Blu-ray that has both of them on it. Um, it... Uh, it has even more Danny and even more Abra. There's a lot more backstory. I mean, the book's like 600 pages. Uh-huh. Um, so there was a lot of condensing that had to happen just to get that in there. Um, I thought when it came to the cult, I thought they wasted a lot of time basically creating... I think they're trying to make strong characters out of the cult. But for me, it felt like... Like, for example, the recruit was just useless to me. She was just the person to walk around and go, what's this? And then they explain it. Um, but I didn't think that was necessary. I felt like the, the film tried, especially when explaining things about the cult and powers and things like that, they tried really hard to hold your hand. And I don't think that was as necessary, um, especially looking back and contrasting that with The Shining, which doesn't hold your hand at all. It tells you absolutely nothing and everything is inferred. Um, like even down to the scene where uh, Ewan McGregor comes, he's just lost Abra. Um, Billy's just died. Um, he sits down in his apartment and instead of us seeing a gripping scene of him struggling, he pretty much talks to himself, but talks to the camera to say what he's thinking and feeling in ways that are very much like it feels like they're talking down to you. Like the story is trying to explain things to you that they don't believe you can infer on your own. Like, for example, he he sits down and he closes his eyes and he's he's like trying to contact her or struggling with what's going on. And it's, it almost sounds like a producer was like, yeah, we watched the original cut of this film and we want you to make it more clear. And then they go back in and they add him going, Abra, with a bunch of reverb on him, you know, to like show he's calling out in his mind. And then he goes, you said that you're like a radio or like, so like, could I come and get into your body? Like he, he like explains what he's doing before then. And in, I thought that in that way, there was a lot of lazy storytelling where they would get to a point and then they'd kind of just try to explain it by looking at the camera and telling you in ways that didn't really come off to me. Um, I thought that there was a lot of time wasted on the cult, whereas they could have left them a little more ominous, a little more creepy and scary, not as like kind of just cartoon characters. Um, across the board, they were just not useful to the story, for a story that goes on for so long, to the point where I felt like by the time they got to the Shining reenactment, that was what I was waiting for the whole time. I was like, oh, finally, it's here. You know, I think I liked the first like 45 minutes of the film, like all the setup, all the build, all of uh, Danny's character, but w- the middle part, where it was just trying to bring everyone together felt really slow. We, I didn't need to see a character from the cult die. We didn't need to see a character from the cult get initiated. We didn't need many of the scenes from the cult in general. And so by the by the end, I also felt like there were characters almost wasted. Like Billy, for example, was a great character. I really liked him. 
um, I thought they threw him away incredibly quickly. Um, not that the way that they threw him away was bad per se, but I felt like there was no emotional weight given to him as a character, which, you know, that's a directorial choice. Um, you know, if you don't have time for there, it, I mean, that's fine. But yeah. I don't want you to waste 20 minutes on the girl who can just tell people what to do and they do it. And then have her kill a character that actually did have well, something to care about. All, all three, um, sort of threads get, um, fairly equal treatment in the theatrical cut, at least. Um, in that Danny, Abrin, uh, the Colt, uh, I thought it worked on a pacing level because um, you you know they're all going to come together towards the end and they're sort of, you start, start at this triangle of like one, two, three, and then they come here at the Overlook. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that worked on a pacing level because you get, um, for me, you got just enough of them, just enough of um, Danny, just enough of Abra. Um where you almost get that TV style mm-hmm. um, sort of inching it forward. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I was invested from the start. Um, I liked the sort of reenactment bits at the beginning. I liked um, those a lot. Bridging, bridging the gap. I thought they did a good job of, you know, not CGIing, um, you know, Jack Nicholson or uh, the kid or anything, but getting people that I thought that the kind of looked the like them but good. did a good job of, performing it um i really like danny's story and and i just really liked it all the way through um and i really like the end um where where he's like where the place is burning down and it um like it pans over to his mom and then pans back over to him and he's a kid now um i really liked that stuff um i just thought it was a really solid continuation um I don't think it's a perfect movie. I didn't think there was anything um, wrong. G- moving over to the end and the reenactment, I think they went a little too far in the way they showed the reenactment. I liked, I thought all of the um, re- reconstructing the place was really good. Mm. I thought when they started reshooting shots, showing someone who's not Jack Nicholson pretending to be Jack Nicholson, that was where the believability fell. I didn't think it was necessary. Like they were intercutting. You know, I while things were happening, being, I liked him being the bartender. The bartender was okay. I thought that was good. I thought that was decent. Um, the way they showed him, they also kept from showing him. Because the problem is when you try to live up to a character like Jack Nicholson, mm-hmm. you can't. And so don't try. I thought that where they went, I th- felt like they pushed it to the line with the bar scene. And then that was like, okay, we're, we're okay there. But when they started showing him with the axe and like chasing Danny, it was so much less believable. To the point where it also it was unnecessary. The bar scene, I could see that being necessary. Um, I thought I'm not sure I would have gone in that direction. Um, not sure I loved it, but it was okay. I understood what they were doing. When we're in an action sequence and you're randomly flashing to reenactments of the film or things like, for example, I mean, I know the film you need to see The Shining to begin with to really understand the ending at all, but that's the buy-in. So when he's walking through the house and they show um, the door that his father cut through and when his mom was on the other side with the knife we didn't need a recreated shot of the fake mom from this film doing the same thing that Shelley Duvall did and and I understand I thought the mom and the kid did great in the beginning because that was like okay this is a we're moving on but going back and recreating shots with actors that are about 10 notches below what the original iconic performances were we really took the immersion out of it for me Um, just win those flashes and I just thought they, they were completely unnecessary um, from there, I mean, I wasn't super satisfied with the ending. I'll say I, I, but I can understand it. I think that it was one of the better parts of the film was once they got to the hotel. Um, I, I do need someone, I need, I need you to defend one more thing for me though. Mm-hmm. The final scene when she speaks to, uh, Danny, uh, after he's clearly died. Um, and he looks at her and tells her to shine on, shine on Abra. What the heck was that? Can we just talk? Like, he's like, shine on. It was like the goofiest. That was another thing I had with a lot of the film. There was a lot of kind of cringy dialogue. Do you not agree with that either? I I felt it was a stylistic choice that I was fine with. You think, um, you think that's more of a stylistic choice? Because I just found myself saying, like, I, I can believe, I can cut it a little bit of slack stylistically. That being said, I, I, I frequently honestly, found myself from, during dialogue from laughing. all of your criticisms you don't like the style of the movie is essentially what I get. Um, I mean, some of your criticisms are perfectly valid. Um, they didn't bother me at all. It's a Stephen King adaptation. It's a very pulpy genre film. 
um, it kind of comes with the territory. Um, I didn't, I didn't think any of it was particularly horrible. Um, a lot of it was fairly standard movie dialogue. I, um, I can understand that to an extent, but I also have a problem with a lot of standard movie dialogue. I could quote a whole lot worse dialogue from movies that are far better received. I thought there was a lot of really cringy dialogue, I would say. That was, and that was actually not one of my major criticisms. But define cringy. There was a lot, like, I think most of the cult scenes were too much. Yeah, that doesn't define cringy. On the conversations, they were, they were cringy. Um, That doesn't define cringy. Define cringy? Okay. Yes. Exactly. All I have to, it's hard for me to... Um, remember like every single line. So the best one is uh, when he stands there at the end by the window and goes, "Shine on, Abra, shine on." You just quoted the movie again. I think it was just obvious for me in those lines. There were lines throughout the movie that you know, obviously, I can't just recall every single one of them where they just didn't come off feeling right. But maybe that's a me thing, and that when I'm perceiving the dialogue of the film. I don't think that I connected with the tone of the film from the start. Would, would that make sense? Yeah. I th- well, not that I didn't like the tone, but that when it comes to where, whereas you, I think you were uh, convinced by the film from the beginning. So you got on board and you followed it to completion. Whereas for me, there were little things that came up throughout the film that kind of kept distancing me from being immersed in the story and more in being critical of it. You know, like, like you said, where, you know, a film, if it's not getting you with its conflict and its characters, then you start to look at all the other things. For me, it, when it wasn't that I was just looking at all the other things. It was just that, so by the time at the end where I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know about this. I kind of liked the ending. I kind of liked the, the the Shining recreation. But there's a lot of fat on this film. There's a lot of things, a lot of threads, a lot of tones that I just really don't like. That I felt like were silly, you know. I think silly is a better word than cringy. Um, so that by the end, when it's just going in an incredibly kind of goofy, cheesy feeling direction, not that it's wrong to be cheesy, but I found myself, it felt just kind of odd. It felt like it went against the tone of the film a little bit too, in that I felt like there was frequently lines of dialogue or pieces in the film where it was, you, you could almost feel the studio oversight of someone being like, make sure you tell them this here. Make sure it hits like this. They say this thing. Whereas... I felt like the actual film itself and the content of the film was a lot more subtle than it was made to be in the final. So cut. here's here's why I'm okay with that final line. Um, Danny spent his entire life suppressing his shine. He has you know horrible traumatic event that happened in The Shining. Um, he is he he spent his entire life trying to like pretend like that part of him didn't exist. What happens with Abra? poses a sort of hopeful ending in a way where she doesn't have to suppress that and she doesn't have to hide that and she doesn't have to live life the way that he did. So for him to be dead and have accepted sort of what happened to him and how his life went, he's encouraging her to be who she is and, and, and to not go down the path that he went because his led to the addiction and the trauma that is why I don't believe that that line is out of character, and that's why I'm fine with it being the end of the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that goes that's to... That's my defense. Well, when you talk about the line, I use that as an example of just kind of the silly feel of it. That kind of goes back to the world building of calling it shining. You know, he's like, oh, you got to keep shining. Like, obviously, it's going to sound silly any way yeah. you say that. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the sentiment of her needing to keep shining. It's just that there were bits of dialogue throughout the film that felt like that. Um but so in relation to the original Shining film, um, you think it was a respectful sequel that stands on its own? I think because it, I did feel like they kind of, you said they felt, you felt like they earned the ability to recreate The Shining for 45 minutes. However, I felt like in the end, by the time I got to the end, it was like, this is what I've, that was almost where most of the substance for the story was, you know? So um, my issue with a lot of 80s sequels is that they, they use the original as a crutch mm-hmm. the entire time like normally from the beginning like uh, i don't i don't think that blade runner uses it as a crutch i think it's I think it's a great movie but um but it does have that element of like um they parallel the first movie a lot um and this movie was totally its own story and totally it's totally its own thing for two hours mm-hmm. 
So very I, much a continuation. And it I was very much like a yeah, sequel. it's a continuation, but it doesn't repeat the original in any way yeah. until the end. And f- because I liked what they were doing in the first two hours, uh, I felt like it had earned its right to um, do all the fan service at the mm. end. Because by that point, there were things in it that proved to me that there was um, real craft behind it and that it wasn't just an 80s cash-in. Uh, that somebody did have a vision for it and somebody did actually want to make this thing. Well, and I think that's um, clear from the start in the fact that they didn't litter the trailers with the shining yeah as they, well they as had a the, really no hard game. time they had a really hard time marketing this movie i had no idea that it was related to the shining um, like when it first was coming out i had to be like told oh yeah that's a stephen king book yeah. there was that obvious tie-in they did say you know from the you know the stephen king you know the shining they still mentioned it but it did not marketing wise seem like it was like a direct sequel to the yeah. Shining. yeah it's also like nobody was like you know it'll make a lot of money a sequel to that 80s horror movie that wasn't appreciated for 20 yeah, years. That was directed by like <laughs> one of the most iconic directors of all time. Yeah. So to me, there was there was there was actual heart behind it, and there was actually you know people who wanted to make it. Um, it's also it's a studio. It was a, it's a fairly big budget studio movie that they allowed to be written by one guy and directed by one guy. Um, that's fairly unique. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, generally the movie's pretty liked. The, the movie's pretty well liked. Um, but it didn't. It did. It, it wasn't grab a huge hold, hit. would it? Yeah. Uh, like it didn't. Financial. Didn't make a lot of money. I think because they had no idea how to market it. And yeah. A lot of people didn't even know that it was a sequel. Um, even from the trailers, I don't recall ever getting like a great sense of what the movie was even about from the trailers. Yeah. Um, and the posters were really weird. Like they were all just like they tried to like fit Ewan McGregor's head into like the cut. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I mean, I get that, but like most people aren't going to look at it and then go, "That's the door from the shine." Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think there was a lot unique about it. Um. I was really happy with what it didn't do as far as 80s sequels go. Um, and I just thought it was a solid continuation. That being said, like in comparison, it holds no weight to The Shining. The Shining is a yeah. um, far, far better movie. Um, but I also went in knowing that like it's a sequel to a Stanley Kubrick movie. I can't yeah, I, I can't hold it up yeah. to like, well, i got to compare it directly to that Stanley Kubrick movie. Yeah. One of my favorite directors. Like it's just not. So I kind of I, I went into it with a like, well I'm I'm gonna go with whatever they give to me. I'm not gonna um, go like, well I wanted to see this. I was like I'm interested in seeing what new story takes place in yeah. this universe. And from the first twenty minutes, I think the first bit where it was like dealing, you and McGregor dealing with like the addiction side of things, I was like, I'm on board with that. Yeah, I like that route, and I really like the way that they handled addiction in the movie, and I I really like um, the way that you and McGregor. Um, almost tried to channel a Jack Nicholson in a way, like not deli- not um, in a showy way, mm-hmm. but just in a sort of in sort of his cadence and minor things made me be- believe that he was his son. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot that I that I thought was really unique and really liked about it. Um, I don't think it's a perfect movie, but uh, but I, I feel like it's probably the best sequel to. For, for me, it was the best sequel to The Shining I, I could have wanted um, or could have expected. I'm not expected. sure how you would have done that any other way or at all, <laughs> too. Yeah. Like a sequel at, at all. Yeah. The fact that uh, King himself wrote one was strange in the first yeah. place to me. So, yeah. But uh, I, I feel like that pretty much wraps all up most of what I have to say. Do you have anything else to add? No. Oh, so comment below who you think's opinion holds more weight, who you think is right, wrong about whatever you think. Just comment. Let us know your thoughts. Like the video on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever you like. And we will see you guys in the next episode.